Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're so happy that you joined this webinar, and we're thrilled that we're going to be highlighting a grant opportunity from the Michigan Nonprofit Association for general operating funds for nonprofit organizations that have been hit the hardest by the pandemic. My name is Karen Howard. Um, my background is in early childhood and child welfare, and I am a consultant to the BUILD initiative, along with my colleague, Brenda Blazingame. We call ourselves the builders, which I think is super funny. <laughs> um, and it's our job really to assist. We have been assisting um, Kellogg grantees to get ARPA funding. Um, and so I'm going to pause for just a second and give my colleague, Brenda, a chance to say hello, and you'll hear from her a little bit later in the webinar. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brenda Blassingame. I'm lucky to be working in partnership with Karen on um, this particular project. I've been in early childhood for the last almost 23 years, um, working on early childhood systems development and building um, through an equity and justice frame. It's I'm glad to see everybody who's here today. Thank you for joining us. So we want to tell you a little bit about the BUILD initiative, which just celebrated its 20th anniversary. So BUILD's mission is to bring about a time uh, where race, ethnicity, immigration status, zip code, language, no longer determines um, outcomes for children and families. Um, BUILD does this by working with state leaders um, to create policies and infrastructure and connections across agencies uh, for comprehensive, high quality, equitable systems for children and families. It also supports state leaders to embed racial equity within state systems um, using their role as leaders. BUILD also is the technical assistance provider for the Pritzker Children's Initiatives, coalitions of advocates, researchers, providers, um, who are really promoting policies for prenatal to three, for families prenatal to three in 20 states and 10 communities. It's why I like to say that BUILD um, works within government and outside government to play the inside outside game to really bring about change. So I wanna tell you a little bit about what we have been doing with generous funding from the Kellogg Foundation. BUILD has been assisting, Brenda and I have been assisting um, nonprofit organizations, grantees in Battle Creek, Detroit and Grand Rapids. Um, our goal um, is access to pandemic funding. Um, and we have been talking with leaders like yourselves for a couple of months now. And I wanna kind of sum up what one amazing leader said. Um, she said, Karen, there is no shortage of money. Um, it just doesn't get in the hands of the right people at the right time. And that's what this work really is all about. Brenda and I have been working um, to work as hard as we can to ensure that um, ARPA funding gets into your hands because we consider that the right hands um, and the right communities. How do we do that? Well, our goal is the work that we've been doing is hosting webinars and workshops like this one, researching and highlighting and um, bringing to you funding opportunities that are tailored to the needs of grantees. Um, we've been providing uh, support. We are here to provide support and completing applications and grant writing and conceptualizing proposals and ideas. Um, BUILD also has a number of relationships with a number of national organizations that we can bring to bear to provide technical assistance. Um, and we are advocates. We have been providing advocacy support. Um, so you get to those leaders who influence and control pandemic funding. Toward the end of this webinar, this meeting, you'll see our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to us, call us, email us, write us. Um, we're here to assist you um, in getting ARPA money, and we'd love to hear about how we can do that best. Here's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to highlight an upcoming opportunity, a grant opportunity um, administered by the Michigan Nonprofit Association for nonprofit organizations that have been impacted by the pandemic. Um, we're providing a forum for you to provide input to the Michigan Nonprofit Association. We're so thankful to them that um, they're giving an opportunity for grantees to really co-create this opportunity. And today you'll hear a lot um, from them about it, but really uh, this is a chance to provide your input. 
And we wanna explore ways in which we can help you um, with this opportunity as well as other opportunities um, to, to, to get ARPA money, to get pandemic money. So we're so fortunate to have Nellie Sai with us. Nellie is the Social Innovation Officer at Michigan Nonprofit Association. Um, there she, Nellie, um, previously served as the Community and Civic Engagement Director at the Michigan Nonprofit Association, MNA. In this capacity, she was the Deputy Campaign Manager for um, MNA's campaign to engage state leaders and encourage participation in the upcoming 2020 Census. Prior to that, she led MNA's K-12 Civic Leadership Program that connected youth and community causes and issues. Nellie is also a Racial Equity Fellow of the Detroit Equity Action Lab. She lives in Detroit with her family. She holds dual degrees in Business and Education Studies from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Go Blue or Go Home. So I want to uh, turn it over to Nellie right now. Nellie, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Karen, for the opportunity to speak with your group. It's always so weird to hear that stuff read back to you. So I'm just reflecting on that. Thank you. Um, you are going to see a little face join me periodically in and out. Um, we like we are working. That's okay. We like just, children. Just letting you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you want to go to the first slide, a little background about the Michigan Nonprofit Association. I'm going to talk, maybe be off screen for a little bit so you can look at the words. We are in our 31st year of operation and we are a statewide membership association for all nonprofits in the state. We serve to be a resource to nonprofits here to hopefully provide you with resources, training, and technology so that all nonprofits in the state have exactly what they need to be successful. If you go to the next slide, I can share a little bit more about our philosophy in terms of how we operate and think about our programming and where we sit within the nonprofit ecosystem here. We feel like we are, have a unique perspective on the nonprofit landscape. We do a lot of, we try to provide nonprofit leaders and organizations with resources and capacity building that you all might need in order to achieve your mission on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it is connecting nonprofits to organizations in their region that might be able to help you with your financial reporting, with QuickBooks, with volunteers training, some of the back end stuff that nonprofits need to really be able to execute on all the great work that y'all are doing, but also thinking about what are the systems level changes that we can be trying to make as a sector to make sure that the communities and the people that we are serving who have been historically left out of so many important conversations have a place and have a seat at all of these different tables. So that includes some of the work that Karen was talking about our census, making sure that nonprofits are aware of how census affects everything in their communities. Right now we're in a lot of, re, um, we just wrapped up a lot of our redistricting cohort work, but right now we're doing a lot of voter engagement and also just thinking about ways that we can bring civics and advocacy to life for nonprofits, that it's not something that is additional to your missions, but something that we should all be doing to make sure that our voices are heard to um, local and state and federal lawmakers. We really have a vision where all nonprofits and, have, and communities have the resources and services that they need to be thriving. Because I think everyone in this collective room has been drawn to the sector because we know that things can and should be better for us, for our communities, that we want things to be different somehow that there are services that we are providing, volunteering that we're doing all for the next generation in a way. So we're really trying to help nonprofits get there. When we think about why the ARP funding was so important, if you can go to the next slide, please. At the beginning of the pandemic that we're still very much in, we were doing so much outreach with our members, with nonprofits to hear, you know, how is this affecting you? What's going on? What can we be doing? And I think everyone here can say that, you know, nonprofits answered the call. We were asked to do more with less. We stepped up. We were frontline responders. We did so much to make sure that our communities had the resources they need, continue to get food, education, shelter, when a lot of industries were shutting down. When we polled our members at the beginning and throughout that first year, 
We were asking them like, what's going on with your programming? How can we be of assistance to you? How are you doing with funding? Especially as we saw the federal government release federal funds for things like PPP and earn income. Nope, something else. Idle loans that while nonprofits were qualified for them and could apply, it wasn't explicit for nonprofits. So it was really important for our team to get a small nonprofits relief fund. It was a huge priority for us. And we spent about two years working through an advocacy process, working with lawmakers to help them understand the importance of it, how big the sector here is in the state of Michigan. There are roughly 53,000 nonprofits in the state of Michigan. 43,000 of them are 501c3s. The others have other C designations. Of those nonprofits, of the 501c3s, most of us have budgets of under a million dollars as reported on the 990s, most of us do. And when you are looking at financial impacts like the ones that you see on the screen, it can be a lot, especially if you are still continuing to have to deliver on services that you know your community members need. So our the idea behind our funding or this relief plan is to really get nonprofits funds that it's not a huge grant, and I know it's not year over year. It is a one-time operating fund for nonprofits, but it's for you to help keep the lights on, pay utility bills, rent, address overdue building maintenance, and more. I know a lot of us had to scale back or close programs because of funding, of staffing, and other costs. So while these funds, one-time funds, won't solve the crisis that many of us are facing, we're hopeful that this unrestricted funding will still help and benefit you all. Part of the conversation I want to have with you today after the next two slides is to get feedback because we are very mindful of this process, recognizing that this conversation needs to be bigger than just MA's voice and dictating how the application should look, who gets to decide. So we're really hoping, like Karen said earlier, to co-create this with many of you. I also wanted to highlight, if you can go to the next slide, please. Earlier in 2021, we launched a leadership census, and I'm sure many of you probably filled it out, asking you to share the demographic information of your leadership. This is specific to the Metro Detroit area. We also did one for the statewide, getting statewide demographics and nonprofits. We haven't released that information yet, but to give you a snapshot of the Detroit landscape here, of the respondents, again, not all nonprofits in the Detroit area filled this out, but of the respondents who filled it out, you can see um, the representation in terms of whether or not it is representative of census data. So the first graph on your left, the blue bar shows of the responding nonprofits, what their race and ethnicity self, self selected um, are. And then the green line shows you what the Detroit population is of that same ethnic or racial um, demographic based on census information. So while we do have a lot of Black leaders here in the city of Detroit, it is not representative of our community demographics. And that itself is something that we're thinking about and also thinking about in terms of funding. The other one, it draws your attention to asset comparison comparisons. It's limited. I will say that I want to give some caveats to this one. One, this is drawn from 990 electronic data. So if your organization did not file an e-form, so if your organization had assets less than, um, I want to say 50k, it's not included here because you're not required to file electronically. So there are some limits to this comparison, but you can also see that BIPOC led it that we define that as any organization who has at least one executive or CEO president who identifies as a person of color, black or indigenous, their net assets are usually less than the white led nonprofit, which is not surprising for those of us who have worked in the sector for a while, but there's also power behind numbers sometimes. When you know anecdotally, you know from your own experience something to be true, and then to see the numbers behind it, I think it gives us a real charge to be able to say, hey, something really needs to change. And Karen, thank you so much for dropping the link to the full report in the chat. If you do click on it at some point, which I hope you do, maybe during what I'm talking, I'm not sure, but if you do, towards the bottom of that 
page, there is a section called the network map. And that we started graphing out with our friends at Data Driven Detroit, the network map. It shows you um, of foundations we have, again, limited to those who have electronic filings that we had access to. Of those nonprofits, um, who are they funding? And are they funding a lot of BIPOC leaders? Are they funding mostly white-led nonprofits? Again, the caveats are it's limited to electronically filed like foundation reports that we have access to and also limited to the nonprofits who actually did fill out the survey and that we had their leaders' um, racial and ethnic information. So just a little preview about that census with the note that we are getting ready to share our statewide results. Back to the conversation at hand, which is relief funding and how I'm hoping to involve all of you on the call today. Here is where we are thinking for our statewide relief plan. We are working with the state's um, Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, LEO for short, in the administration of the fund in terms of where, um, how we will be working through compliance and regulation, et cetera. They have been great partners so far. What we are hoping to do in terms of co-creating and making sure that we are having a fund distribution model that is accessible and equitable is we're convening two different types of groups. One is a statewide committees. We're envisioning about a six to eight week commitment where we are working through a process of co-creating the RFP, looking at the application and other applications of similar um, really funding from other associations in, um, in the national landscape. What are some best practices that we can pull in? How do you feel about these questions? What are some ways that we can really design this process to fit Michigan? And what is a way to ask questions that is holding ourselves accountable to our communities that we're serving? We are leaning into a participatory grant making process for that. At the same time, we're also working to involve community leaders through a regional advisory board or resource and services um, boards spread across the state. We have, depending on the interest, we're envisioning about eight different smaller boards like this, where as a board member, you will be given um, training on being able to provide technical assistance, help with the outreach of our funding, and also provide opportunities for peer learning amongst, the, amongst your region, and also help with the grants review process. We think it's a great opportunity to get local voices involved in ensuring that the grants are going to nonprofits that can really benefit because we, we know only as much as we know, and we're not in every community as deeply as we would like. So having community leaders at the table is really important to us, as well as helping us be able to do that due diligence piece of making sure our nonprofits in each of these communities are able to continue to deliver on the missions that they're doing. And honestly, it will also help inform m &A in terms of what are some programming pieces that we can do beyond just giving out funding? What are some capacity building initiatives that we can be working on in different regions to help grow the ecosystem beyond just giving you a one-time infusion of general operating funds? If there is a need around board governance that is coming up through these conversations of outreach, how can we help bring in some voices and training to do that? So we're looking at it as a short-term engagement for a long-term strategy of really strengthening the sector. I am amazed at how you handle family members and do a webinar and present. It is amazing. <laughs> so. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for the grace here, everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, um, our work is about children. And that means it's about babies. So um, it's a come as you are always. Um, so now everybody, we're gonna um, shift a little bit and go into some questions um, that we're doing as polling questions. And then we're gonna have some discussion about them. Our first polling question is, what should the funding model be for this grant opportunity? And there are three choices um, that you can make in that. And so if we could get the poll up, so everybody that's participating can answer. So choose one of these three choices. Sliding scale so that funding level is dependent on the revenue of the nonprofit. 
nonprofit organizations, the second one is nonprofit organizations that apply for grant funding should be allowed to set the amount that they are requesting or grant funding should be a set amount. So our goal here is to get some thoughts from all of you who have joined us today um, on how this could move forward from your opinion um, and your perspective. So everybody, please do um, choose one of those three options. And then we want to have a little bit of time um, to discuss the options. Interesting. So we have about 19% of the people that are on the call today that are interested in sliding scale as the model. Um, the majority clearly are interested in nonprofit organizations applying for the amount um, that they believe they should be and think they should be applying for. And just a few in terms of the grant funding should be a set amount. Thank you very much. So um, we'd like to open it up. Please feel free to come off of mute and to talk or put your comments in the, um, the chat so that we can um, get a conversation going. What does it mean to you all that um, to have it set that nonprofits, a nonprofit would apply for um, the amount that they believe is most important? So our first comment we have is the advantage is does the 177 a month Medicare charge go away? I'm not sure exactly. Nellie, do you know, I what, know that what that is? is? Yeah. I don't think I know what that is. Nellie, could, um, Tara, could you either write more or could you come off mute and say more? That would be really great. While, while she's doing that, Nellie, I wondered if, if you could just give some context to what you're hearing from others in terms of the funding model whether you're Great. hearing that folks should be able to set their own amount. Um, yeah, we have been hearing um, very similar to this that I know a lot of traditional funding from grant makers is usually option A, that it's based on your um, reported revenue assets that you have on 990. So if you, and I think the mindset from that grant making perspective is that if you are a nonprofit who files a postcard, the 990N, that means your assets are, or your revenue, sorry, I use them interchangeably and I know they're not, but I'm also not a tax person. So I do apologize for that. But I know that if you're filing a postcard filing, that that means you have a revenue of less than 50K. So from a grant making perspective, I think, the idea is offering a sliding scale and capping it at like, if you only have 50K in reported as revenue, that maybe you're only eligible to get $5,000 because you don't want to burden the smaller nonprofit with the financial implications of getting a larger funding amount. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, to the comment here, it does perpetuate and you keep people in the same patterns. Because a lot of organizations that we've talked to in, a, in our one-on-one -on -one conversations are on that precipice of getting into, um, and they would want to make that jump into larger revenue streams, but they can't because they are constantly held to this. So that's why option two is here, that, if you are a 50K nonprofit, but you want to apply for that 20K, you know, we, through this opportunity, would make sure that you understood, like, that means you can't file that postcard filing anymore. That means you have to file this. Do we have the tools and can we help you with the technical assistance so that you understand what that means? And pull, 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 great, let's do it. So who are we to hold you back? So that's also the idea of time B. Yeah. See, we just, a... I, yeah. So that's kind of the thinking that we've been having back and forth um, around what type of model we can have. So I want to bring um, into the conversation, Nellie, a couple of mm -hmm. comments that are coming um, in the chat. Yeah. One yeah. is Kelly Christopher is saying that when we base funding on revenue, we perpetuate racism. Black organizations have historically had less money. When we restrict those organizations from larger funding, they are never able to grow. And then exactly. Stephen, Stephen has said, for funding based on revenue, I was thinking the larger the organization, the less it can apply for. That's great. And I want to 100% um, agree with Kelly Christopher's comments. And to Stephen's point, I would say that we are 
the eligibility for this as we go through the process with Leo is that we are targeting small to mid-sized nonprofits. So you can't have a revenue larger than right now, I think is a million dollars that we are looking at. So that's really great because I think Nelly, what you're also trying to do is get in to work with the nonprofits that are much more proximate to working with an end community um, so that it, the impact with this money um, can really be felt in that work. Okay, let's go with our next polling question, polling question number two, which is, would your organization be interested in serving on the statewide advisory committee convened for this grant opportunity? Yes, no, it depends on the time commitments and requirements. So everybody take a moment and let us know how you feel about this question. And so we had, as people are doing that, we had a question come in from Tara, which is, are you saying that NPOs with budgets of over 1 million would not be able to apply? Nellie, would you like to address that? Yep, we are um, co-creating, we're finalizing the um, landscape for that. We are, our tentative conversations that we are, I don't want to say negotiating, but in some ways we are, is that yes, 1 million would not be able to apply. Other conversations have exclude, have included extending that to 2 million. Um, so we're still finalizing that language, but it won't be higher than 2 million. So if you do have a nonprofit that has a budget of over 2 million, you will not be eligible for this funding. Um, it's that one to $2 million range that we are still um, needling over. I think I'm good with that verb, needling over that. <laughs> <laughs> great. I think that's a great verb for this. Um, thank you for the question, um, Tara. So can we see the results of this poll, please? So overwhelmingly, it is. it depends on the commitments and requirements. Um, so... Could you, Nellie, talk a little bit about what you all are seeing as the commitments and requirements of being involved on one of the, uh, with the statewide advisory committee? Great. We are, for the statewide advisory committee, we are anticipating about a six to eight week commitment um, of meetings. We are looking at 75 to 90 minute meetings during that time frame. We're thinking of a weekly model because it is a shorter term engagement but it would definitely be, be based on people's availability to convene. It'll all be virtual. We, in terms of requirements, you just have to have written a grant before, applied for a grant. You don't have to have been successful applications of grants. It's not necessary. You just have to have experience of going through a grant process, applying, looking at questions and understanding um, what can be reworked from um, as a grant applicant's perspective. We really wanna make sure that we are leaning into conversations of ways that grant applications have historically perpetuated harmful stereotypes of communities, et cetera, and hearing from people who fill out grants on a regular basis or have more experience is important. Um, we're hoping to be able to offer folks stipends for their time, but we can't say to that one way or another. But in terms of time, it's just really your expertise and your willingness to say, these are the right questions and these are not the right questions. Yeah. So just to get a sense of um, where people are, for the people that said, depending on the time commitments and the requirements, um, we don't have a poll for this, but maybe you could put in the chat. Would it make a difference for you if you were there was a stipend for your participation? I think that's really important for us to know um, in terms of this conversation. And so if it would make a difference, just say yes in the chat. And if it wouldn't, say no. And let's maybe see where we end up. Um, we do have a question from um, Lyric, if organizations have a budget over two mil, are they eligible to participate in the statewide advisory committee, Nelly? No, we would be open to having that perspective um, okay. and serving on either committees will not disqualify you from applying. Great. Thank you for catching mm -hmm. that other one. So I saw one reply to my question about would it make a difference in terms of if there was a stipend, um, I'm going to encourage everybody to just pop in the chat whether it would make a difference or not. Thanks, folks. I really appreciate that. We do want Nelly to live with a strong sense of um, what this group thinks about 
um, mm -hmm. this work that's getting uh, that's taking place and and it's still forming. Brenda, I have just a clarifying question. This is sure. And it is who makes the decisions based on, on who gets grant funding? Um, is it the regional advisory boards or is it a, another entity? The regional advisory boards would be part of the grant review process. They would read all the applications that come in from their region, um, give us their recommendations for funding. They would have to go through a, because it is a federal and state fund, mm -hmm. we would then submit our rec final recommendations based on the regional's um, voices for um, their vetting process. I imagine they would, they would sign off on most of them, but there is that check um, Great. And Nellie, are you- Check and balance is the phrase, sorry. Yeah. Can, is that open for it. volunteers as well? Are you seeking- The regional, them? yes. Uh, the regional, okay. Sure. So, so folks know that the regional, and, and will they be stipend? We are hoping to fundraise for that as well. Um, this The regional ones would be a larger time commitment, We're into, but not as frequent. But we are anticipating a six to eight month engagement because of the outreach and the training involved with that particular um, engagement series. Great. And if folks on this call are interested, what should they do? <laughs> uh, please email me. Excellent. Great. Last question regarding that. If they do serve on the regional boards, are they disqualified from applying for funding? No, but they wouldn't be able to weigh in on their own application. Thank you, that's critical information. Great, thank you. Yeah. Great, great questions, Karen. Thank you for that. So let's move on to our last polling question, um, which is, what technical assistance would be most helpful to you with respect to this grant opportunity? So as Karen mentioned in the beginning, um, she and I are working um, to, connect people more directly with um, opportunities that are coming up around ARPA. So this question begins to get to that, the work that we're doing, but also begins to get to how people are feeling about their um, ability to apply for um, these grants when they are available. So if everyone could just take a moment and either identify um, in terms of Notification and targeted outreach to organizations when the grant opportunity is available, um, assistance with application and grant requirements, um, assistance with determining and managing tax and other implications of receiving the grant funding. Nellie talked a little bit about that a few minutes ago, or other assistance. And if it's other assistance, please do um, take a moment and pop what we've missed into the chat so that we can capture that. Very interesting, thank you. So the majority of people said notification and targeted outreach when the grant becomes available will be um, the kind of technical assistance that they're looking for. Uh, about 21% said assistance with application and grant requirements and about five um, assistance with determining and managing tax and, and other implications of getting the funding. So, um, I would love to have some people populate the, um, the chat with the second one, assistance with application and grant requirements. When For the people that said that that is what they would be looking for in terms of technical assistance, um, can you give us a little bit more? Would that be for you, would that be specifically assistance in actually writing and developing the grant that you would send in? And if, if that's what it is, please um, do populate that into the chat. And I am gonna ask again, is there anything that we missed on this poll in terms of other assistance that might be useful mm -hmm. to people? I know nobody did that one, but you know, as you're thinking about it, it would be great to capture if there's any other kind of support and assistance that would make a difference. I see um, in the chat, Oh, there's just some comments about our last our last polling question around the stipends, whether that would make sense. Um, thank you, Cecilia or Celia, who already said she's interested in serving with the advisory grant review work. That's really great. Um, if you are interested, um, I'm going to ask you, um, Celia, 
if you would also just um, populate that with your uh, email address so we can get in touch with you. And Nellie's email address was put in a little bit ago. And when I when we send out the follow up, we'll include um, all that information again. Right, Karen? Yes, absolutely. Great. So Leah also said that um, that at her organization, they um, at my org, we often help give TA smaller orgs with their proposals. That's really great. So knowing if there's someone local who could also do that. Um, Lyric put a comment in, I think notification and targeted outreach is crucial and the other kinds of assistance we were, are really good to make available as well. Wish mm -hmm. there was a both option. Thank you for letting us yes. know that. Very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Kelly is said, it would be nice to know what types of organizations um, are on this call. What type of annual revenue? If there isn't representation from the under 1 million or under 500,000, you may need to be getting the fee. You may not be getting the feedback you need. Really great point, Kelly. Absolutely. So we don't have a poll for that, but I am going to ask um, for people who are um, participating right now, could you put in the chat if your organization is under a million? And let's get a, a sense of how many people here are under a million. That's a great idea. And um, a comment from um, Celia is that there's a need for smaller orgs to get that TA in order to apply. Yes. Um, there's another comment that smaller nonprofits often struggle with capacity building and a real barrier for many to applying for larger grants is having an annual audit. Helping them with this piece would be helpful. And I I think that name is probably Jackie or Jacqueline, but it cuts it off. It doesn't give me the full name, so I can't Jacqueline. do that. Yeah, that's a great point about the technical assistance um, related to that for under one million. If I could interject just to have Nellie yeah, go ahead. tell us, what are the statutory requirements of this grant? So folks can know which, you know, which requirements that you don't have discretion to change. We are targeting 501c3s or fiscally sponsored organizations by of C3s as designation within the charitable nonprofit landscape. Um, you have to have been in um, existence or, yep, existence is fine, since 2019. Oh, she's awake. Uh, mm -hmm. Since 2019. So if you are a new or organization, you might not be eligible because this is really, really funding for nonprofits who have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. Um, so if you started in 2021, um, that would not qualify you. And we are still working through what proving you're negatively dis um, impacted by COVID-19 means for that piece. Because it is state, um, it is funding from treasury. There is also a regulation that if you receive Receiving previous federal funding um, or federal aid like PPP does not disqualify you. However, you cannot claim that same hardship for this one. So if you use PPP to cover payroll for X number of employees and you are using this application to recoup that same cost, that will make you ineligible for it. But if you receive PPP for to cover payroll for X number of employees, but you're using this one to for um, rent assistance or other operating needs, but not payroll for that specific need, then you can still apply. I hope I explained that properly or in a way that makes sense. Thank you, Nellie. I think I think you did. And if folks have questions, they'll hopefully can put it in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. There's another uh, question question comment in the chat. It is wow. Are the over 1 million growing from grassroots? We've got some work to do. So in looking at the response, we've got a strong mix of over a million and under a million. Um, so that would say to me, yes, that the comment about having um, more outreach to do to reach um, smaller revenue-based um, nonprofits um, definitely needs to happen. Um, and Nellie, I don't know, do you know if the organizations um, that organizations that are over a million in the, in the state, did they grow from being grassroots to that? Um, 
And anybody else that is um, on the call right now would love to hear from you. If your organization is over a million, did you start as grassroots with a much smaller and you've grown over time? Um, and if so, how long have you been in existence as a, a nonprofit and having a budget over a million? Nellie, um, I saw I, you. Oh, I can't speak to how um, how their budget sizes have grown. I don't have that information and I would hate to just say something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know that um, across the country that making that there there is that space that and I think it's from a, moving from a million to three million. That's a very difficult space to um, overcome and to really get yourself three million or above as a nonprofit. And so I'm also wondering kind of, Nellie, do you know what we know about what it takes to move from under um, a million from like 250 to 500,000 to being a million dollars? Is there any research in the nonprofit field about what that takes and how, how difficult that may be for an organization? I'll have to look into it. Um, I would imagine some of that also has to do with, I think someone else talked about in a comment about audits and being subject to different types of regulation. Mm -hmm. I think fundraising and getting that funding in is of course one of the big hurdles and as you gain momentum, et cetera. But I think at some point when your contributions get to be of a certain size within a calendar year, you're subject to more, you're just subject to more. You have to have that um, single audit done and that is costly as someone said. So that could also be part of the issue. It's just a full systems perspective. Um, I don't have a specific answer though beyond that. Yeah, thank you, Nellie. Thank you for that. And Nellie, I just wanted to clarify also one thing. You said that um, if you got previous federal money for payroll, you can't get it again. But if you got previous federal money for payroll for a certain period of time and that you're now impacted on payroll, are you now eligible to get this funding? I want to say yes. You mm -hmm. just can't be double dipping for the same exact need. Gotcha. Got you. Thank you. Then I'd like to ask folks, what other advice would you have for Nellie to ensure that this is equitable um, and it gets into the right hands and those that are most that have been most impacted by the pandemic? So any other observations that she should keep front of mind? Yeah, I'd like to make that, a, that question's a great one, Karen. I'd like to make it a little bit more specific. What steps need to be taken to reach the community-based organizations that are nonprofits that have the closest proximity to working with and in communities of color? Bingo, I think that gets it, Brenda, thank you. <laughs> Oh, this is, there's an interesting comment. Mm -hmm. Many black nonprofits were stug, struggling pre-pandemic. We may not be able to prove COVID made things worse. Um, any thoughts on that comment, Nellie? That's a really good one. And I deeply appreciate it. Um, I would love to have another conversation because I wonder if there's something we can build into our application to address anything like that. Maybe there's priorities given, but still making it eligible for anyone. I am open because that's definitely a perspective and something to keep in mind. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments? So again, if you are interested in being involved, please do put in the chat your name and email address so that there can be, um, I would ask you to email Nellie, um, mm -hmm. but also this way we can be, um, uh, proactive in reaching out to. Marquetta has a question. Hold, Says, hold on, on. I'm, I'm not typing fast enough. I, that's what I, I hate chat for that reason. I can never type <laughs> fast enough to get it in at the moment it needs to be in. Thank you to everybody who is putting in their name and their email because you're interested in being involved. Thank you so much. Yeah. We really do appreciate yeah. that. One of the, I do have one last question and, and we'll hold it open a little bit because, you know, thank you so much, Nellie, for um, lending your time and getting this input. But I wondered, and I wondered from, from the folks on this call as well, what's the best way to ensure geographical diversity as well that you're reaching throughout the state? Um, 
And if there are thoughts on that, that would be great. That's great. And we have a really great question that just came in. Um, and I think it's from uh, uh, Maketia. Um, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, Maketa. Uh, yeah, mine's so the, so the question, she's got her hand up. Great. Can we unmute her and let her speak, please? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm sorry if you guys, if you, if you can't hear me, let me know. So yeah, so I I, I am a represent Mommies in the D and we are a small organization, but what we're seeing is that a lot of different small organizations are, we're serving the same community that have been uh, impacted by COVID. And since we were actually birthed in COVID, uh, we do understand some of the uh, the morbidity rates that have possibly increased or were able to like pull and understand where some of the struggles are, especially with housing um, or just understanding, um, you know, uh, health wise, if they're able to access the correct resources uh, to support their pregnancy. So I was wondering, and I, I do believe that other organizations are sort of wondering, is there a way that we, we can collaborate as a bigger unit to be able to receive uh, funding through like one grant. I do understand that most times it is through one, you know, uh, organization and, you know, uh, but we're trying to figure out, is there a way for us to work smarter and not harder applying for the same grants, but seeing it kind of go to some of those uh, larger organizations, if this makes sense. Such a great question. Nellie, can, can nonprofits collaborate and submit a joint application for greater funding? I think that's what you're Yes. Yeah, hi, Nelly. Hi. How are you? I was just gonna say hi. I'm doing good. Miss you. All right. Good to hear you here. Um, also, kudos on your nonprofit. Um, because I think we talked a while ago. Anyways, that is a great question. I think because we are also being held to some state standards, if you are collaborating within a network it would be have to be an agreement that you would have with a fiduciary or a fiscal sponsor who is a 501c3 and how you would distribute the funding. Um, that there would be one check that would be issued to one partner and that you would have some MOUs between yourselves to be able to address how that funding is distributed um, is one way I could see that playing out. But I would definitely raise that to our next meeting. We yes, do have a question sponsored about- sponsored groups are allowed. Okay. And Nellie, um, somebody asked, what does the timing look like in terms of next steps? Great. Uh, we are hoping to have the RFP ready for sometime during the first quarter of 2023. So within the January to March timeframe. Um, before we have an RFP that is going to go out with like the full application, we are planning to put a, a, an intent to apply form that will go out in January. That form is just collecting interest so we get a sense of the scale and the outreach that we'll need to be able to uh, distribute the funding. And it should take you about 10 minutes to fill out. And it doesn't actually disqualify you from applying. It's a series of yes, no questions, asking you where your organization is located, if you're, what your EIN is, if you have one, if you're fiscally sponsored, do you have these things? Yes, no, yes, no. Um, just so we get a understanding of where interest is coming from, where we might need to um, concentrate on doing outreach and also giving us a sense of the technical assistance that our nonprofits will need to be able to submit a successful full application in the future. So all, yeah, 2023 is the short answer. I gave a very long answer. And Nellie, lastly, we have a question about fiscal agents. They are able to apply as well. Is that right? Yes. Excellent. Okay, we'll take one more minute, I think, and we can close out. But if folks have last comments and thoughts, um, please raise your hand or put them in the chat. Know that the BUILD initiative will be following up with Nellie and working closely to see how we can help with this, how we can get the information out in a timely way to you, how we can set up also providing um, some technical assistance support along the way with application, with any um, um, 
reporting requirements that may be down the line. Nellie mentioned maybe there are more fiscal requirements. We would love to help with that. Um, and so we are going to be staying in close contact with the Michigan Nonprofit Association and Nellie um, and seeing how we can be the most helpful um, um, to you. Let's give a minute to see if anyone has any, any last question. These slides will be available as well as the recording. We will send that out um, right after the webinar. Nellie has put her information into the chat and we have um, my contact as well as Brenda's. And so we would really encourage you to reach out to us. We have your information in the chat. Those who have said that they wanted um, additional information or for us to follow up with and Nellie to follow up with, um, and we will do that. And so with that, I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining the webinar. I really wanna thank Nellie um, for all of your work, Nellie, over the years um, and for, for having input and soliciting input and making this opportunity equitable. Oh, thank you so much. It was so great talking to or talking at the screen. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.